I am not going to start this off with a blind joke. You know why? Because Tozen is not really blind. He can see the light of the true essence of a person's soul or some bullcrap like that. Now, he's blind as a bat or a cricket. Or crickets blind? I don't know. He's also a cricket. Okay, so this will be Captain of Squad 9, Kaname Tozen Zanpakuto Suzumushi, which I actually own. One of the few Zanpaktos on the list that I actually own. Fun fact, this was the uh, first Zanpakuto that was ever sent to me by a fan. I've gotten a few over the years. I got uh, Nozarashi, I got Kenpachi's sword from a fan. I got Ichigo's new swords, his Zangetsu from the final arc. I got that from a fan. Uh, but yeah, this was the first one I ever got. And it's actually a really cool sword. Um, as you can see, it's, I like the orange aesthetic, the orange and black. I think that fits really well. It's got this hoop earring here, which actually plays a pivotal role during his Bankai release. Even the guard looks sweet. It's like a teardrop kind of deal with like a bunch of little rings in it. Um, and also, it's one of the few katanas that I own that actually has a blade on it. Like, it's not just a blunt edge. Like, it's an actual blade and it's very sharp. So I'm going to sheath that and not use it and <laughs> for the rest of the video because I don't want to accidentally hurt myself. So, if someone ever breaks into my house and I, am like, managed to get into my room with all my swords, I'm like, Suzumushi is my go-to because it's the one blade that actually has a sword. Well, Ichigo's new Zangetsu does as well, but it's, like, huge. It's hard to actually swing that thing. So this is my go-to. Maybe I should take the ring off of it because, yeah, this this doesn't really work for stealth, you know? It, it, it seems more encumbering than anything. But, okay. So Suzumushi, this is how you write it. You take the kanji for clean or pure and the kanji for insect, and that makes cricket or bell bug, as in the English translation. Um, very interesting because the whole basis of Suzumushi is sound and vibrations, which kind of fits Tozen given the fact that he's blind so he might rely more on sound in order to, you know, perceive his surroundings. Also, being a Shinigami, he can, you know, sense spiritual pressure and everything. So, while he might be blind, he's not, like, blind in the sense, like, he can't see anything because using spiritual pressure sensing, he can, you know, detect people's riatsu around him and everything, so he's not going to be bumping into people. And the fact that he attained the rank as captain of the Gote 13 proves that his blindness was not an encumbrance to him, right? So, yeah, now, Suzumushi, it, it really shines during the Soul Society arc. That's when we get to see a lot of different features of Suzumushi. I believe it's actually the first Zanpakuto we see that has more than one Shikai ability. Up until that point, it was like, you go into Shikai and you have really just one ability that you can use there. Like, for example, Renji, you know, Zabimaru, he can extend his blade out like a whip kind of sword thing. Um, Hainako, which is uh, Rangiku's sword, you know, it can turn into ash and cut the opponents. They might have, like, different kind of attacks with it, but it's just like, okay, it's it's like one main thing. With Suzumushi, it seems like there's a few different things you can do with it. Um, its release command is cry, and the first time we see it is actually a really cool scene. Uh, it just kind of, like, lends to despair in a sense. It happens right after Uryu's epic fight with Mayori, and I remember that episode, and you know I'm a big fan of Mayori and Uryu, so that episode was intense. It was a two-parter, and we get to find out all about Uryu's past and things, and he takes the Sanrai glove, and he breaks it, and he, epic music music plays in the background, and he uses the let's still form, and he crushes Mayori. Mayori manages to turn into jelly and escape, but Uryu manages to survive, and he gets the cure to the poison, and he's walking up the giant staircase, you know, barely able to walk because his limbs are all numb, the Rodden So Ten guy is wearing off, and he's like, oh, he's all beat to crap, but he might actually make it. Who else is gonna stop him, right? Like, we might actually get to the top of the stairs and rescue Rukia, and he gets to the very top, and Tozen's just nonchalantly standing there. He's not a bad guy. He's not evil. He's not like, ah, oh, welcome, Quincy. You might have defeated Mayuri, but now I will make sure your blood is stained. Yeah, nothing like that. He's just standing guard, and he's someone that really does believe in the true justice of the world, although it does become rather perverted later on. Not perverted in the sense like, you know, lustfully, but perverted in the sense of like, ah, oh, yeah, Yes, uh, justice, uh, true justice is turning into a giant cricket monster and eliminating the goate. That, that's how you know you got true justice right there. Tozen gets a little bit crazy near the end of the fake Karakura arc. After he goes all cricket Ryuk form, he's just like, <laughs> I can see, I can see, Saji, you uggo man, I'm gonna attack you, you know? So yeah, a little bit less, um, 
little bit less with the with the finesse later on. He just goes crazy. But, you know, in the Soul Society arc, he was a pretty cool character. He's just chilling out there at the top of the stairs. Uryu walks up, kind of like confident, like, I might actually be able to do this. Wouldn't that be funny if I got there first? And he gets to the top of the stairs. And he sees Tozen, knows he's a captain because he's got the, well, insane spiritual pressure, but also the Heori and everything. And there's this moment where Iryu's just like, Oh, crap. And Kaname is just like, I'm sorry, Ryoka, but for the sake of peace, I cannot allow you to pass. Cry. Suzumushi and he just like unsheaves it just a little bit and it just sends out this like high frequency like and just hits Uryu and just overloads his hearing and just knocks him out flat. So that's the first ability we see, all right? Vibrations and sound, all right? So a really high frequency thing, and then just knocks your ass out immediately. Now, Kaname's not a bad guy at that point, so he's not just gonna, like, run a sword through you. He carries him off to Squad 4, where they get thrown in, like, a special cell, and they get their injuries treated and everything, and, you know, so he, he's that kind of guy. Same thing with, um, you know, Shunsui with Chad. You know, Shunsui did not finish off Chad. He's like, all right, all right, I'll knock you out because you're an invader. You're a Ryoka. I can't let you just do as you please, but I'm not a cold-blooded killer. I'm not just going to end your life here. We'll throw you in jail and we'll figure out what's going on. Also, the whole thing with Aizen at this point, although, of course, Tozen was fully aware of what the deal is with Aizen. He wasn't actually dead, but Shunsui wasn't, so that's why he threw Chad in the, you know, Squad 4 barracks. Okay, so that's his one ability that he's got, which is pretty cool. Just, he doesn't use it all that often, actually. I think that's the one time he does use it in the anime and the manga at all. Just, you know, uses it to knock out Uryu. Maybe there's, like, certain conditions that had to be made like because you figure that's a pretty OP ability if like you're just in the middle of battle like he could have just been fighting um you know I'm gonna stop doing that Matt this is an actual blade I'm not gonna screw it like I'm so used to doing it like I'm just gonna wave around because it's not a big deal but like I really got to be careful with this thing I do not want to end up slicing my hand on camera and having to run to the ER okay like that's not something that I want today all right so anyway yeah you know like when he's in the middle of fighting at Fei Karakura when Shun not Shunsui when Sajin and, uh, you know, Shuhei are coming at him, a lot of S names, coming at him, you know, he could have just, like, unsheathed his sword and been like, cry, Suzumushi, and then he's like, yeah, and then his they just get dropped like that. So there might be conditions to it. Then again, Uryu was already pretty injured at the time. Um, but you think an ability like that would work really well on Sajin, because Sajin has the more sensitive hearing, because he's like a wolf dog, human, Shinigami person. You know, but then again, at that point, you know, when he was exposing his true nature and everything, maybe he was like, oh no, that would be too easy to just knock them out with Suzumushi's cry ability and then finish them off. No, I want a, I want a serious fight with them, you know? So I mean, that's the reason he doesn't use it. Another ability that he has, we see this during his fight with Kenpachi, which is an offensive ability, is uh, Suzumushi Nishiki, Benihiko, which is like the second ceremony, and then it creates, basically, he swings his blade like this, like an arc, and then, like, the path where he swings his blade creates a bunch of more blades, like, you know, kind of like a vibration, like a resonance, like, and it creates other blades as it goes, and then just a rain of swords just come down on the, uh, on the target. And so it's like they're actual blades. They're not like sound blades. They're not like illusions or anything. He actually creates other blades that just rain down on the opponent and they manage to hit Kenpachi and like stab him in a few places. But Kenpachi just like pulls him out. The blades don't have any like special traits or anything. They're just, you know, like a storm of swords, so to speak. So that's how that works. Pretty interesting ability. It was so a an ability that knocks people out, like a kind of supplemental ability and then an ability that actually causes direct damage. So yeah, that was pretty cool. It kind of like the first Zonpakuto to really see that. There were other swords later on that had, like, more than one ability in the Shikai, but I think Suzumushi was really the first that showcased those two completely separate abilities. They both follow the same theme of vibrations or sound, just in very different ways. Alright, so then after that, he continues his fight with Kenpachi, where we get to see his Bankai. The one and only time in the entire series we get to see his Bankai. He uses Suzumushi a little bit during Fei Karakura, but it's mostly just immediately jumping to his Resurrection form, his giant cricket, where he 
no longer uses his sword or his Bankai or his Shikai. He's a completely different kind of life form. Not even really a visor, honestly, because it's just like, think of Tozen maybe more as like a perfected visor, where, you know, the visors like Shinji and everybody, those were failed experiments by Aizen the way he looked at it. He's just like, yeah, this didn't turn out the way I liked it. However, with Tozen, maybe it's more perfected where the Hollow and Shinigami spirit are more balanced, so he could actually go into a proper resurrection and everything the same as a regular Arankar did. So that's what's different there. It's kind of a shame too, because his Bankai was pretty unique, and we don't get to see that during the fake Karakura arc where Tozen dies. We kind of got teased from it. There was a scene when um, Sajin and T Kaname are fighting for a little while, and then, you know... Kaname's like, I think it's time I ended this, and Sajin's like, ah, you're Bankai, I see. Well, I will prepare for that as well. And Kaname's like, heh heh heh, my Bankai, I have a power far beyond my mere Bankai. And then, you know, so we don't get to see that again. But his Bankai is Suzumushi Suishiki Enma Kurogi. It's so fun to say, Enma Kurogi. So, how he does it is he takes his blade... And the ring plays a very pivotal role here, as I said. He basically takes the ring, and I'll see if I can do it here, does kind of this maneuver, and when he activates his Bankai, the ring begins to spin, like, super fast and expand, so the ring is now, like, the size of himself. And then kind of the same deal with Benihiko, where the vibrations create multiple swords, the vibrations create multiple rings here. Sometimes it's nine rings, sometimes it's ten rings, depends, it kind of changes throughout the course of the manga. But anyway, the rings then separate and surround the entire opponent and Kaname as well, like, because it can affect a large area, so this is actually ideal for kind of dealing with a lot of enemies at once. But in the case when the only time he used it... Well, actually, no. He did use it during Turn Back the Pendulum, but it wasn't really shown in any grand way. It was basically just like he uses it to blind Kensei and wipe out Squad 9. So it's ideal for taking out multiple targets. But it's not like Kensei fights Kaname and his Bankai or we get to see a new ability of his Bankai. It's pretty much just like Bankai make everyone go blind and deaf and they can't, you know, sense spiritual pressure. He then gets the jump on Kensei and then takes them out. And then, you know, that continues... Aizen's plan there, right? So that's the only other time we see it, but the proper time we see it is against Kenpachi here. Okay, so when the rings all uh, kind of extend out by a decent distance away, they emit like a dark light, and then it turns into this giant black blimp sort of looking dome dealy. It, I don't know exactly what you call this, but it looks cool. And so all of the different rings then shoot down wires to like, you know, anchor it into whatever, you know, area it's in. So they were like kind of on top of a building when they, you know, fought against, you know, each other there, so it just kind of appears there. It's not really explained in great detail, like, can people enter the dome or leave the dome, uh, but that's not really the point of it. I, I would assume it's an area, an enclosed space, kind of similar to, honestly, like, Ask and Naklevar's, like, you know, gift ball kind of thing, where it's just like, yeah, you can't enter or leave unless I allow it sort of deal. So, whoever's inside of this dome area um, has all of their senses, except for the sense of touch, removed. So they can't see, they can't hear, they can't even smell anything, nor can they sense spiritual pressure. I don't know about taste. I would assume taste also got removed. But the sense of touch is the only thing that remains. The only person that is immune to these effects is the person wielding Suzumushi, which you would think is, oh, it's just Kaname, but not necessarily. So if the enemy manages to grab a hold of Suzumushi, the effects also, you know, dissipate for them as well, and their senses return to them. Uh, the inside of the dome, it's actually a pretty cool design because each of the rings have like a different kanji in them and I actually had to go hunting trying to find what those individual kanji were because normally you could just look it up on the wiki like what is the kanji for Suzumushi and there it is I couldn't actually find the kanji that are inside of Enma Kurogi there so I had to go a little do bit of kanji hunting I couldn't find them all but uh, the most obvious one is this one which just means death uh, this one is Hone which means uh, bone uh, there's another one that means like um, defeat you know is in there so basically you know what they basically say what you would expect them to be like you will die when you're in this dome you will suffer defeat feet. You will be a bleached skeleton on the ground. See what I did there? Bleached skeleton. Ha. Huh. They didn't use that reference more than I think they should have, but whatever. So, yeah. That's the situation with the Bankai. Now, at first, you might be thinking, wow, that is a devastating ability. It robs the user of sight and, and the ability to hear and smell and even sense spiritual pressure. That is so incredibly broken. All Kaname has to do is just activate the Bankai and then slice people down. Problem solved! Yeah, 
In a perfect world, that would be the case if he would just learn to shut the hell up! <laughs> I get it. I get it. You know, Kaname is the kind of character, he really likes to talk about his sense of justice. He's the kind of character that's like, I have my sense of justice and I need to let everybody know about my sense of justice and my morals and my goals and my ambitions. You know, I need to let people know. So even if they can't hear you, you idiot. So he activates Bankai. Kempachi for a moment, he's stunned. Anybody would be stunned if all of a sudden your senses just got robbed, you know, just like all of a sudden you can't see or hear or smell or even taste anything and you're just like, whoa, what? You know, that's the prime moment and he did that a hundred years ago. I guess he was a little bit more expeditious about how he used his Bankai back in the day because he just goes Bankai and slices down the different members of Squad 9 and Kensei and doesn't really, he doesn't really, you know, take time to explain what's going on. But with Kempachi, for whatever reason, he really just wanted to monologue the crap out of that guy, even though he couldn't hear him at the time. So he goes into this space, and he thinks he's invincible, and he's just like, Well, Kenpachi Zaraki, what do you think? You can see nothing, and you can hear nothing. However, I, who have seen darkness since birth, am completely immune and used to the darkness. But however, you are trapped in a dark, silent hell of your own making. I'm like, dude, just stab him. It's not hard. You know, just bonkai, and then take out the sword and just ching right through the heart. Now, this is Kempachi we're talking about here, so that still might actually not kill him. But you know what I mean. Basically, what Kempachi did to counter this is he still had his sense of touch, which is the glaring weakness of this ability. Um, you could say maybe it leaves the sense of touch on purpose so the opponent can still feel pain. So it's like even adds more to the fear. It's like, okay, you can't, you can't sense anything around you, but you can still feel when you're getting cut. So that adds like a whole new level to it, right? Of like, uh, kind of like a little bit of like a torture aspect of it. However, with Kempachi, this backfired because Kempachi is a seasoned veteran when it comes to fighting. He knows his way around a sword, and when it happens, when he gets cut, or there was a fly around here. Dang it, Tozen! Insects are kind of like a symbol of his sword, and all of a sudden, there's like little fruit flies buzzing around in here. But anyway, yeah. So when Kempachi gets cut with a blade, he knows exactly like how far the person is, like standing away from him, how much of the blade is entering his flesh, and from which angle. He can sense all of that because he's just been in so many battles so it takes him a little while he doesn't get it right away but as Tozen keeps trying to slash him he always tries like he always avoids getting a vital hit at the last minute and you know it's just like at the same time he makes a counterattack that gets closer and closer to hitting Kaname eventually Kenpachi succeeds and like nicks him and Kenpachi's like I got him that time because he could still feel his sword if his sense of touch was robbed as well he wouldn't even be able to like oh he would be able to still feel his sword but he wouldn't he wouldn't know he is because it would just be like your entire body just goes numb. So standing would be difficult, difficult, holding anything would be difficult, maybe even like breathing would be difficult if your entire body just went numb and you couldn't feel anything. You know, you would really have no idea what's going on here. You could be getting slashed up like a freaking Thanksgiving turkey eight ways to Sunday and you wouldn't even feel it, but let it, you would just start to feel more and more dizzy as you would lose blood and your sense of like balance would be this thrown out of whack and you would just lose consciousness and then just fade into the gentle good night and that would be it now not as not as i guess poetic because you know you figure kaname also really despised kenpachi like kaname hated what kenpachi stood for he was like the exact opposite of him in every single way so he really wanted him to feel the burn he really wanted him to feel the the despair and the pain of a cruel death in a silent world but kaname come on this is kenpachi Zaraki we're talking about here all right you're not throwing in an, a magical barrier around you or anything you're just you you took away his sight and his smell and his hearing and his spiritual pressure as if he still can't fight back oh he can still fight back you know like if he would have used two hands there you would have been screwed kaname whenever kaname gets attacked or suffers a you know like a great injury or like loses a lot of blood the blimp thing just disappears just shatters into a million pieces and so then it just returns to its regular 
first aid and you know everybody can see everything at that moment and so yeah we don't get to see the bonkai again after that which is unfortunate because there's a few different I, I honestly think it would have been more useful than his cricket form because all we really got to see in his resurrection form was he could send out like sound waves and stuff I think like one ability he had was like last not not last no chase but like um oh, what was it called I forget what it was called but it was like he makes like a bunch of rings in the air and it shoots out like vibration like cannons and stuff that was really cool um but it's just like more of like a direct attack sort of ability and then of course we all know the major downside of his resurrection you know, and it gave him the ability to see except he's not used to being able to see because he was blind since he was born so all that sensory input at once he's not going to be able to cope with that and then Shuhei got the coup de gras on him and finished him off there which was a grisly finish like when he like ran freaking Kazeshini right through his head and just you know reap Kazeshini and it turns into a scythe inside of him that was a pretty metal finish but yeah I think the I think his regular Bankai if he was just like cut to the chase like that would have been a way cooler fight I think if you know he just you know Nick snade the whole cricket thing or maybe you, you could have still kept the resurrection cricket form but maybe he could have still went Bankai while in his resurrection and his Bankai got an upgrade or something you know on top of robbing all of your senses it also creates a bunch of like you know cricket clones inside or bugs to like attack the enemy from all different directions so you don't know where Kaname's at which nullifies kind of the weakness that he had with Kenpachi like all you got to do is figure out where the one attack is coming from grab him and the effect is basically nullified if he had like a bunch of bugs inside of the dome buzzing around attacking the opponents you don't know where Kaname is going to attack from next something like that would be a cool benefit like be a cool like upgrade to it but we just never see that so that's the Bankai now there's one more thing we have to talk about involving Suzumushi, because it is very, very weird. It is a unique thing amongst all Zanpakuto. We've never seen this in any other context, okay? Suzumushi is not Kaname's sword. Kaname had a friend growing up who was a woman who joined the Gote 13, we don't know anything about this individual. We do not know uh, her name. We do not know exactly like what what division she was in or how she led like what led to her death of eventually. We knew she had a scar on part of her face, which I think was caused by a hollow. Uh, we just don't know anything about this person. But it was a friend of Kame. She was a friend of Kaname. And she died, and then at her, like, funeral, she had, like, a casket where she was lying in it with Suzumushi next to it. And Suzum Suzumushi looked just like Suzumushi does now. It didn't, like, revert to an Asauchi or anything. It had the same exact layout of the blade. It had the same guard, the same ring, and everything. And then Kaname went up, picked up Suzumushi, and used it as his sword, and walked away. Um, so maybe you could say that when, because it's always been stated, like when a Shinigami dies, their Zanpakuto dies as well. It, 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 it just disappears. That's like, we've seen that happening. Like when Byakuya was on death's door, Senbon Zakura began to just fade away. It didn't revert to an Asauchi. It just began to crumble apart. And we've seen that in other cases, right? Where the sword begins to shatter as the Shinigami nears death. Okay. Um, but with the, because the Shinigami's Zanpakuto is themselves, in a sense, because they split their soul into it, right? But when Kaname's friend dies, the sword's right next to her, and then it looks the same as it always did, so it's implied that the Suzumushi that uh, his friend used was the same Suzumushi that he uses, and he picked it up, and he could just make it his own. Um, maybe you could say, like, um, you know, maybe Kaname and his friend were so closely connected uh, maybe when she died, part of her soul that was in Suzumushi lived on because of Kaname and, you know, chose a successor, but we've just never seen any other sword work like that. We've never seen it. This would be like, okay, at the end of, uh, Yamamoto's fight, they managed to recover, like, it, his Zanpakuto wasn't completely destroyed, but it might as well have been. It was, like, all charred and broken and destroyed, um, so it was basically, like, charcoal, just kind of maintaining sword form that they recovered from the fight. You know, this would be like, like if Shunsui walked over and picked up Ryujin Jaka and made it his own sword, it would just be weird, you know? Like, it is a strange thing. Now, granted, this was back during the Soul Society arc, so maybe Kubo didn't really flesh out, like, what a Zanpakuto was, or he didn't have, like, a definite idea on what this was going to be, or how the Asauchis work yet. You know, he really didn't sit down and come up with, like, okay, this is definitively how Zanpakuto's work. 
until, like, the final arc, when we definitively find out how Zanpakuto's work. But from the way Nimaya explained it, the way the Asauchis are and everything, it doesn't seem to be possible to be like, oh yeah, you have a Zanpakuto, it's catered to yourself because it's your own soul. You can't just give it off to somebody else. That's not how it works. Um, but it is how it worked with, with Kaname. The best explanation I can get here is that, yeah, the sword reverted to Asauchi state, so Kaname's friend did not have Suzumushi, um, but no, no, she had to have had because it had a ring on it. It was the same sword. So yeah, it. I'm going to say maybe Kubo just wasn't 100% on what Zanpakuto's were yet, and he wanted a cool story with Kaname, like her, his friend died and he picked up her sword, and then later on he just, Kubo completely forgot about that backstory and just moved on to the, the explanation that Nimaya gives. That's, that's the best way I got. You know, that's the best explanation, because he does pick up Suzumushi. It has the ring, the ring is important and everything for the Bankai, so I'm pretty sure Kaname's friend had the same sword. So, you know, that just roll with it, because that's the explanation we get all right so yeah there's that but yeah interesting sword cool powers you know we just don't get to see it after the soul society arc he just moves on to using the cricket powers uh one last ability though we do get to see during that arc is uh he uh shows he's able to vibrate his sword at will uh, which is probably what he uses to create the sound, but he can vibrate the sword without creating noise at, like, whatever frequency he probably wants. So, Shuhei takes Kazashini and wraps the chain around the blade of Suzumushi, like, oh, you're, you've trapped me. And then Kaname just causes the sword to vibrate, and the chains get kind of knocked free, and then he just pulls the sword out. So, that's another ability we get to see from it, but um, beyond that, we don't get to see him use it during the fake Karkar arc all that much. But, anyway, that's, uh, that's Kaname Tozen's video. So now moving on, we got to decide on the next Zanpakuto. Um, my God, we went through all of these already. I remember when I started this, I'm just like, every time I start a new discussion series and it's like, oh uh, man, I got to make like 13 videos. This is going to take forever. When did we start this? Like March? You know, it's, it's June, so it's about like, you know, three months or so. So that's about right. But yeah, it goes by fast. It really does. All right, so we got one Shinigami left. And I really hope in this random... This random lottery, it's gonna be Sembon Zakura. Alright, you guys ready for this? Are you ready? Alright, here we go. Yeah! It's Senbon Zakura! Alright, so we're gonna end it all off with the captain of the 6th division, Byaku Yakuchiki. Probably the single most popular Shinigami captain, in my opinion, disregarding Toshiro. Um, but yeah, everybody loves Byakuya. He's got a really cool story, a lot of stuff to talk about, really cool sword. Uh, plays a big role in the Substitute arc, in the Soul Society arc, is there during the Arankar arc, he's there during the Fake Harakura, learns some new things about his sword, we get some character development from him. Uh, brother of Rukia, you know, we, we got a lot of stuff going on with Byakuya. I think that's a perfect way to end it out. And I Actually, I was at an anime convention a few months ago, and I managed to get a wooden replica of Senbon Zakura, so we have that. So yeah, I think it's a perfect way to end it out, and it's not something I planned. It's just the random draw of the cards. It's just how it goes. Alright, well, hope you guys enjoyed the series next time, last episode, and then after that, we'll be moving on to a different kind of discussion series. So, sit back for that. Prepare yourself. Alright, gird your loins, everybody. Teching signing out. Now cry. Suzumushi. Also, by the way, did you notice? Go back and watch the episode because it's really freaky. The episode where Kaname first goes into his Resurrection Cricket form, he sounds like Darth Vader. It's actually rather disturbing because he goes into the Cricket form and he's just like floating there in the air and he's breathing. And the breathing is kind of like a cricket. So every time he breathes, it's like you hear like a cricket in the background like... <gasps> And then when he finally like like looks up, he like 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 raises his head up to look at Sajin. He makes like a Darth Vader noise where it's just like a It's 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 disturbing when he first goes into it. After that, he kind of goes just a little bit nutter butters, but before that, it looked written sounded really cool, so yeah. <laughs>